Okay, welcome to KRCB TV. My name is John Gonzalez, and I am super honored to be having uh, a guest here uh, to my left uh, by the name of Bruce Coburn, who is a musician of all sorts, uh, a recent author, and overall a great man and humanitarian uh, in, in our world. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Thanks for the lovely introduction, too. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, like I the great man part. He's a great man, You're great. And, and, and I found this out. I knew you were a great man when I first met you by intuition. Uh, we are here to talk about the music of Bruce Coburn, uh, his history, his past, songwriting process, whatnot. Uh, but also, uh, this tremendous book that I had the fortune of reading in the last 10 days uh, called Rumors of Glory. It's a memoir of which you warned me about a couple years ago when I first met you, Bruce. Yeah, I was in the thick of it. it well, it, it came out about a year ago. That book and uh, for the three years preceding its appearance in the world, I was slaving away, working on it. And it was a, it was hard, I have to say. Uh, at times it was great. The actual writing felt kind of cool. It was uh, um, not dissimilar to writing a song, which I've done a lot of in my life. Uh, you get kind of get to, on the trail of an idea and it's and, and follow it down whatever path it leads. But dealing with deadlines and the sense of pressure of having to kind of get this cranked out by a certain date. I mean, I missed a number of deadlines. The publishers were quite annoyed at me at times uh, for that, but, um, but you know, it got done in the end and I'm happy about it. So. Excellent. Well, well, missing the deadlines is definitely part of your persona of being a troublemaker. So, <laughs> or being uh, an artist in general, I think. Or, right. Um, yeah, anyway. If you don't know who Bruce Coburn is, um, he has over 20 studio albums, 23 studio albums, and, and then some live recordings and, and other uh, things. He also has multiple Juno Award uh, recipient, he's a winner, uh, and that which is the Canadian equivalent of the Grammy, I, right. think, I suppose. Yeah. And in 2006, he was given the first humanitarian award uh, through the Junos, and, and that's, that's pretty cool. And also, he's part of the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Um, that is in what Ottawa also is it in your in your home? Uh, I don't know if there's an actual room somewhere that, has, that 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 is the Hall of Fame. It might be kind of a virtual one. I, I, there might be one somewhere. I've never been to it. If there is, it's just an entity. Huh? It's it, it's yeah, like an entity in the Star Trek sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bruce has received a commendation uh, from the Cal from the California State Senate, and is also an officer of the Order of Canada, which is, is that equivalent of being called Sir in England? Not quite, but, but it's, uh, I guess it's being like, it would be equivalent to being a member of the Order of the British Empire or the French Legion of Honor, I, um, I, get, I guess. It's the highest civilian award that Canada offers. And uh, there's, there are three levels of it. I was a member of the Order, I got promoted to being an officer, and then you know, if I were an ex-prime minister, you know, or some other kind of big wig, I, I'd get to be a companion of the order. Um, but uh, but then I'd have to keep the company of some ex-prime ministers that I probably don't care for much. Uh -oh. So, I'm happy where I am. Amen. So are we. Okay, so let, let's talk about, let's get to the music, which is the, the origin of your success, I guess we call it, or, or your profession, which you chose not to, to address earlier when signing the paper. What what was your first epiphany? Uh, I, I've read your book and, and I, I kind of sort of know the answer, but your epiphany when you were younger uh, to say, I'm going to be a musician for, for a profession. Um, I never quite made an, an actual decision to that effect, but um, early on I, uh, I started playing guitar when I was 14. I had had music lessons on a couple of different instruments before that, but when, when I got hold of a guitar, it started to really mean something. And I, it's partly the age, I guess, too, but I was very much influenced by the original rock and roll by, by Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley and um, the music of that era. And uh, that's what made me want to play an instrument. When I got out of high school, my parents were going, well, where are you going to college? And there was no resisting that. I, I offered a feeble resistance because I didn't really see myself going to college, but it was, I had to. But I discovered that they would... Uh, back the idea of me going to a music school, so I ended up going to Berklee College of Music in Boston for a couple of years. 
And when I dropped out of there, which I did because I realized that the composition course that I was taking, I, I, I was on, on track to get a degree in, in, in composition. Um, but a couple of years in, I realized that it, that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. I had no idea what it should be, but it, it would involve a guitar. And I dropped out of school and I, you know, I just kind of just jumped off the cliff, basically. And uh, I, for, as far as I knew, I wasn't thinking in terms of career. I knew that I didn't want to be uh, a school music teacher, for example. Not, there's, not that there's anything wrong with that, but that wasn't for me. Um, there were various things I knew I didn't want to do, but but uh, I ended up joining a band that some friends of mine put together, and it just went from there. I started writing songs. Excellent. Thanks. And and did you conceive during this time that within years you would be rubbing elbows or be in the company of people like Emily Harris, Jackson Brown, Neil Young, uh, Lou Reed, as you mentioned in your memoir? Uh, yeah, that, that, no, I didn't conceive anything, <laughs> actually. I just was like, well, I'm going to be a guitar player. If I end up being a guitar playing bum, so be it. But, you know, then I, in this, this is the mid-60s where all this started to happen. I joined this band, and the, that was followed by another band and another band. And um, the, the second last band I was in ended up opening shows for Jimi Hendrix and Cream and some other people that were fairly big at the time um, and it was a, it wasn't a very good band but I guess we had some kind of connection to somebody that was putting on those shows I can't really remember how the politics worked but we did that and uh, and then I by the end of the 60s I had decided that I'd had enough of being in bands that weren't quite cutting it and uh, enough of the tension of Fighting over arrangements of songs, or which songs we were going to do, or whether what you know the four or five dollars that would come in for doing a gig, and um, I decided I wanted to go solo, and I felt like there'd be an audience for that at the time. Uh, I thought that maybe I wasn't the only one that was tired of long, wanky guitar solos and stuff. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not totally tired of that, but <laughs> but I was then. <laughs> so I, I you know I started presenting myself. As, as a solo guy with an acoustic guitar, and um, and I, I had had a bunch of songs. All this, these various bands had I'd been writing songs for. And by the end of, the, of that period, I, I had a small body of work that really worked better when I played it alone anyway. So that's what I started with, and that's the stuff that's on the first couple of albums, um, which the first album came out in 1970. So. It just kind of went from there, and after that, I was lucky enough to hook up with a good manager who has a gift for strategizing, and uh, and we I'm still working with him. Bernie Finkelstein. Yeah, Bernie Finkelstein. Yeah. Well, I I I, I would think you probably consider yourself pretty fortunate in that sense because I, I do think that you share the same pains that, that other artists and musicians uh, in dealing with the financial and the business aspect of, of your career and it sounds like Bernie has taken that on since the beginning. Bernie, yeah, I mean there was a, a lot of tension between us at times over, which was really reflective of the tension between the art and the business because the business was his thing and, and is uh, and he was very good at that but sometimes I felt encroached upon by that and resisted, you right. know. So, it was, it, for me, there was a lot of maybe more energy than I needed to spend trying to keep the the artistic center from being invaded. You know, um, I, I it I, it worked out pretty well in the end. Uh, there's a good balance there, I feel, but um, I, I think I probably worried about it more than I needed to. That was my nature, I guess. Right. Do you think you could have done it without <clears throat> no. Bernie? No, I mean, something would have happened, but I have no idea what. It wouldn't have been the same thing for sure, because it, it really has been a, um, been his uh, astuteness that has kind of made the next thing happen, you know, or at least set it, set, laid the ground for the next thing to happen. Uh, you know, I've been coming up with songs and do, out there doing the performing, etc., but... Um, 
without somebody to kind of steer that into the world. For all I know, I could be sitting in a basement somewhere having it as a hobby. Or, you know, I could have ended up doing who knows what. I mean, you, 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 when you start going what if, you can think of anything, you know. So. Yes, the imagination can go wild. Yeah. Which sort of leads to my next question. Um, you, you, you know, there's a lot of people your age, musicians, uh, who have made uh, life as a musician. A uh, career. Uh, I've read David Byrne's book. I've read Willie Nelson's most recent book, and I've read yours. And uh, what I noticed through the different memoirs uh, and the takes on, in, on life in music is how much change has happened in the last fifty years. Yeah. Um, more so than ever, the J curve, is, if you want to call it. Um, how 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 do you think you would be able to fare today? Is because today nowadays there's the term DIY, the do-it-yourself musician. Uh, um, I've I've done the same myself where you spend so much energy on music and art and rehearsing and, and your actual music and then you have to balance it out also with the social networking nowadays and the promoting yeah. um, how do you, how, do you think you can I don't I know I you know I I don't know enough about how that works um, I, I am where I am and I I was where I was when all that started <clears throat> excuse me and so for kids that are starting out now, or anybody, you, know, you starting out now, if that's if if you think of yourself as starting, I mean, I don't I don't have good advice to offer because I have no idea. And it seems to me, when I look around, most people don't have much of an idea how to translate the DIY part of it into uh, something you can get paid for and and therefore survive on. You know, I mean, without having to think in terms of. Massive greed. If you want massive greed, I guess you got to you, you still deal with big record labels. Um, they're they're still there and they're doing fine. But uh, but they're doing fine with Katy Perry and you know Drake and whatever. So um, it, unless that's your bag, you're left out of that scene. So where else do we go? And I don't know the real answer to that. I think uh, you know there there will be an answer. People will figure it out. But it's, it seems to be taking a little bit longer than I thought it would for that to happen. And in the meantime, there's great energy in in the DIY process. the 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 problem is there's no money to pay for things like sidemen or a studio. So that you're condemned to whatever sound you can get in the room, in whatever room you're, is accessible to you, and whatever equipment you can get in, your, your hands on. And, you know, where if it, will anybody ever make a record with an orchestra? It, not too likely in that, in that field, at least. Um, so it, it, there's, you know, people want to hear the music fill out their, the, the, the sort of creative space they can imagine. But that creative space is limited by the, to, you know, the, the kind of technology and the, uh, and the economic circumstances. So, you know, somehow we have to find a way around that. That's a good point. I guess. Yeah, I guess. It, well, I'm, I'm going to kind of go off the grid a little bit, and, and I'm, I guess I'm going to try and find a little bit of humor aside here from you, Bruce. Do, do you, have you had, your, what is your number one Spinal Tap moment? Uh, uh, in, in front of people, in, uh, in front of the camera, what went wrong at one time that you somehow had to recover from, and did you recover? From? I feel like there's a really good one that I can't think of right now, and I'm, that may be a, a some sort of interior defense mechanism. <laughs> but but um, I do remember falling over backwards in the middle of a long wanky guitar solo one time, but not in the '60s. This was in it would have been in the '80s, and on stage in a big concert hall, and. Uh, a friend of mine named Murray McLaughlin was sitting in with the band and and, uh, and playing guitar as well, so I was free to kind of play a big long solo. And, and I'm walking backwards across the stage and tripped over a monitor and fell flat on my back oh dear. while playing. And the the cool thing was everybody was shocked and like, you know they're all looking like this, but I just I for whatever piece of luck I didn't injure myself landing and I just lay there and finished you know kept on playing. <laughs> I couldn't get up because I would have had to stop, but I could keep playing in the prone position. So, so that's kind of what happened. It was a bit spinal tappy. You might have started a trend. Well, you know, maybe I don't know. Maybe. I I did see John Lydon do that one time at a in a club, and um, 
in Cleveland doing a show, and he, this is with Public Image Limited after the Sex Pistols had disbanded, and he, he was trying to get the audience going, and, and it was a lunchtime show, and people were, you know, having lunch and drinking beer, but, you know, finally, some audience member did throw a beer can at him, but, but it was not enough to satisfy him, so finally he just kind of cursed everybody and lay down, and he did the rest of the set lying on his back. Oh, well. Maybe he'd heard about me. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Yeah, well, it, 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 you might have started the trend, Bruce. Uh, I was a punk before there were punks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, can, can you give us a glimpse into the songwriting process? It, it, it brings me... I, I've, I've been raised on the, I believe it was the early 90s, first line of the song Hook by um, the Blues Traveler, and John Popper is a songwriter. And the line is, um, it doesn't matter what I say as long as I sing with inflection. <laughs> and in reading your lyrics and listening to your music, it feels like you've kind of taken a somewhat of the other part of the spectra of um, putting words down first and then mm -hmm. glossing over with the music. Is Can you offer some insight on your process? I write with, from starting with words, um, pretty much always. There are one or two exceptions, but um, I, I have a lot of trouble thinking of words to go with a tune. I think of tunes sometimes, and they'll, if I if I do that, it'll end up being a guitar piece, probably an instrumental piece, because um, well, I just have a lot of trouble making words that that feel right. I you know you can think of things t to put with the music, but I, it's never really worked very well for me. So I start with the words, and when I've got a a body of words that's sort of solid enough to hang a tune on, then I'll start looking for music to carry those words. I've described this elsewhere as a bit like scoring a film because you've got you know a, possibly a story or characters or a situation um, or, or a scene that you're trying to paint that that wants musical support but the music should not dominate uh, from the way I approach it the music you said there needs to be a nice marriage between being able to between a listener being able to kind of grasp what's being said and and feel the music. So, you know, I mean, other people start with a great melody and it goes from there. I've talked to lots of songwriters about this kind of thing. And in fact, there are a few people who do it the way I do, but most don't, most start with the music from what I can hear. So it, it, and it, it goes on. Sometimes a set of lyrics will go through a couple of different versions of music before I settle on something that really works. I'll sing a song for a few months a certain way, usually not in front of people, but because there's usually some reservation about it, it isn't quite working. And then uh, one day it'll just go, oh yeah, this is what I need. And it'll go in some totally different direction. Excellent. In, in reading a lot of your lyrics that I still hadn't heard music to, a lot of your songs can pass as straight poetry from what from what I gather very readable from top to bottom with the meaning and, and so that that's that it almost feels Dylan-esque in that sense. Well Dylan was certainly a big influence on me um, um, and were as were a whole lot of poets um, of, of poets who were writing for the page. Um, Alan Ginsberg, T.S. Eliot, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of people we studied in, in the higher grades of school but, um, and a lot more as well. But um, it was Dylan and John Lennon and a few other writers of that era who really sh showed how you could fit that approach to writing words with music. And um, you know, so I guess I, that was the ball I tried to run with. I, I don't want to think I think if you listen to some of my very early songs, which hopefully no one will ever hear, um, they they sound very Dylan-esque. Some of them, some of them don't. Some of them sound like other people that I was listening to at the same time. You know, but but uh, like there's a, there's probably a couple of Frank Zappa imitations in there too. <laughs> but but um, but Dylan was the, the biggest influence in terms of, of uh, how to imagine what a song could be. Right. Um, yes, it, it's well. That's a great person to have as your as an icon to to want to you know to be inspired by. 
Yeah, and I was lucky enough to, to get hooked up with a, a, with a poet, a guy named Bill Hawkins, who became a kind of mentor. He was a, a kind of unofficial member of that, that first band that I joined after I dropped out of Berkeley. And uh, this is in Ottawa, Canada. And he, I, he, he was like a real beat poet, quote unquote. You know. To me, that's what that's how I thought of him. Um, and I, I had, you know, in my, in my latter years of high school, come to um, idolize a lot of stuff about the beats from you know, through Kerouac and, and Ginsburg in particular. And um, so to have a guy that was an actual poet that I can hang out with was very meaningful. And, and he taught me a lot about the use of words. Um, a simple point being, if you can cross it out, cross it out. Like go, go you know, write what you're going to write and then go back and take out all the stuff that doesn't have to be there. Just a simple thing like that can make a huge difference to a set of lyrics. And, um, and also, of course, it, it, that when you're writing a song, that concept has to be balanced against the dictates of uh, of rhythm and melody. So sometimes you got to put in the extra word to make it fit fit the, the tune. But in general, um, being a ruthless editor is very uh, is a useful skill. And you took that approach. You did you do a lot of crossing? I out? do that. Yeah, I do it all the time. I do a lot of crossing out. I've got, I, 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 in the very beginning, I didn't so much. I but uh, because I was sort of desperate for any idea at all, and and I was a lot less picky about things. But over time, and, and I mean, in the first few years, this was a radical process and, uh, and a quick one. And then, you know, as time has gone on, I become fussier, and and I also have to think about what I've already said, and I've got a lot of songs out there, and I'm not that different a guy than I was 40 years ago, so, you know, so I, I still have some of the same things to say, but then I, I'll start writing something, and I'll go, oh, I, I already did that, I can't, that's no good. You know, it becomes a little harder to think of a new idea, especially a new idea, but if not that, um, a new approach to an ongoing idea. Okay. Uh, well, definitely the content changes as, as I've read in your book about, you know, you usually live life and how you became involved in, in politics or, or with, you know, said all that went on in Central America in the 80s, uh, which we'll get to here in a second. But I would like to ask you another question here about music before we move on. And uh, tremendous lyrics, beautiful lyrics, bountiful lyrics that you, you have in, in all of your, your, your albums and, and your songs. And you, you know, also have been allotted for your, your humanitarian work. Uh, most particularly with third world nations and, and the oppressed. Uh, but there's also something I believe that maybe sometimes gets overlooked about you, Bruce, and that is your guitar playing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading uh, from, I think, a musician magazine 20 years ago or so, and it was about Eddie Van Halen. And the person, the, the interviewer asked Eddie Van Halen, uh, how does it feel to be the greatest guitarist on the, in the world right now? And he said, I don't know, you'd have to ask Bruce Coburn. <laughs> What's your, what's your take on, on such a, a nice thing from, I, from Mr. Manning? Well, it is, it is a nice thing, and it's, a, it's become an even nicer thing over time, I think, because it, the, the story gets repeated. But um, the, uh, my theory is that he was being sarcastic. <laughs> I, I, don't, I met him after that. I had not met him at that point, and I, I met him after, and he didn't seem to have a clue who I was. Mind you, he was getting ready to perform at the time, and, and so, you know, he might have been thinking about other things, and that was with a group of people, etc. His hair might have gotten in the way too. Maybe, but he was—he uh, he did a really good performance on, on this occasion, uh, as I imagine he usually did, but or does, for that matter. But um, I—I I just thought, you know, because he didn't have—he didn't really seem to recognize me particularly, and I thought, well, okay, he—he he said that, and, and I just have this kind of vision in my mind of. An annoying interviewer pestering him with stuff, and and you know, talk going on about me before the interview started, or before the cameras came on, or the mics, or whatever. Uh, you know, and then and and then Eddie just going, you know, I don't want to hear any more about this guy, Coburn. Who cares? And and saying that. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know the truth of it. 
Very interesting. You know, if you get a chance to interview Eddie, ask him for me. So. Okay. <laughs> Until that, it remains a mystery. Yes. As is the theme in your book quite a bit, uh, for the first time at least I did. Uh, but there's a lot of talk here about um, religion and most importantly, divinity uh, and, and your relationship with the divine. And, and I found that very, very, very interesting. I know we all have our own relationships with the divine. Mm -hmm. or, 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 But in transition from music, have you had divine or I should say, uh, encounters with the divine while you're on stage performing? Um, interesting question. I, not, I've, had a, I've had other encounters with the divine that were more obvious than what, whatever might have happened on stage. There have been moments on stage uh, where something transcendent seems to happen. But it's different from, uh, the book talks about a couple of encounters with uh, with a spiritual presence that, you know, fortunately has not shown up during a show because it would have been terribly distracting. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I, and I've been in the woods where, I, or, you know, or just in, in other kinds of settings where there was a presence, a sense of a presence. Um, so, but on stage, not so much. I mean, uh, you know, one time, eons ago, uh, I remember trying to perform at an open mic thing, having taken a bunch of LSD. And uh, my fingers kept getting stuck in the neck of the guitar. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a terrible experience, but uh, and I never did it again. But um, um, no, God shows up when God shows up. And it, sometimes that presence will show up as just a feeling in the heart. Uh, sometimes it's a physical warmth, sometimes it's just a sense, sometimes it's a voice. Um, and other times it'll be something more out in the world. And, so, and uh, it might be a product of, of gazing at the night sky and feeling... Uh, I mean, there's a couple of different options there. You're looking at the night sky and you could feel tiny, infinitesimal and of no importance, whatever. Or you can feel a wave of love that seems to pervade the whole cosmos. And to me, that's an experience of the divine. And I've had that experience on numerous occasions. And, and um, the book talks about a couple of more specific encounters that, that, that led me to become a Christian or just to, to call, start calling myself a Christian uh, early in the early 70s. Because um, when I got married, for instance, at the end of 1969, we were standing there on the altar. And my brother, one of my brothers was best man. He had the rings. We, and at, right at the point where we were about to exchange rings, I became aware of, there was the priest, there was Kitty and me, and there was my brother, Don. And there was somebody else standing there. I couldn't see him. And it was a him, for sure. But, but there was a present. It was an energy, like there was an en the energy of a person was there. And it was radiating and light and warmth and you know uh, I was like oh it, you know nobody else knew but me nobody nobody had that sense but me but here it was so what was that I figured I'm in a Christian church it's got to be Jesus who else would it be so I became a Christian after a while I didn't do it right then but but it, I, I met that that presence again later and at that point there's a song called All the Diamonds in the World that doesn't talk about that encounter, but it, but it, it was written the next day uh, in Stockholm after I'd had this encounter, the second encounter with that, with that person. And, you know, I would, it, do I still think it was Jesus? I, it might have been. I don't know now because I don't feel, I've been through a lot of changes since then. This is, I mean, there have been decades go by and, and lots and lots of life. And, um, I still, I lean toward thinking of myself as a Christian, but I, I have a little trouble with the historicity of, the, of Jesus, and, and I, I have trouble with, um, certainly trouble with the tribal elements of belonging to any kind of church. Um, I've been going to a church in San Francisco that is free of that tribal sense so far in, in, in the past year I've been going there. Um, and I, that's been a welcome thing, but too often, 
faith, which I think you said this earlier, the, it's about a relationship with the divine, however you define that or perceive it. Um, it isn't about creating social conventions, and it isn't about reinforcing prejudice, and it isn't about a whole lot of other stuff that people make it about. Um, so, um, you know, I think the book talks a lot about that too, as do a couple of the songs. Yes, yes, you do. And um, you also mentioned in the book how your first, the first time that you really, what you might say, I guess dis or just you, you lost your respect for authority was when uh, your father took away your book of poems. Or? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, that was kind of an emblematic moment in a way. I, I, I this is, I can't remember how old I was. I'm fifteen or sixteen, I guess maybe, maybe a bit younger. But I was trying to write poetry, and of course, it, it was dribble. It was derivative, you know, of beat writers and derivative of. A lot of, I stole a lot of stuff from horror stories I was reading, and you know, I had it all in a notebook. The notebook was called Excretions of a Mental Leper, and it had a drawing on the front of a guy with a big worm coming out of his forehead. And, and so my dad uh, one day took me aside and he said, well, you know, um, I found this book of poems of yours, this writing you've been doing. And that, first of all, irritated me all to no end because it had been in a desk drawer. It wasn't sitting out. He had been going through my desk drawer. Why was he doing that? We never addressed that issue. But uh, So the next thing, and I should say before we get too far into this, my dad was a great guy. He was a very, very good man and, and he did his best to teach us to be good people, etc., etc. And, you know, um, so this isn't a slag on him, but it, it, it was part of what happened. And so so he, he tells me that he's found this thing and it, it was kind of disturbing to him, but it, it, you know, and so I'm okay, yeah, all right. And I said, well, you know, he said, I don't, I don't want your brothers to see anything like that, you know. So it, was, it, it was nothing even slightly risque as far as I can recall, and it, although there might have been something he would have interpreted that way, I don't know. But there was some horrible stuff, I guess, and violent things. Anyway, uh, so he, so I said, okay, well, I'll make sure that you know it's never where they can find it. He said, well, I destroyed it, and I was really pissed, and I, and uh, I didn't say anything because it wasn't that wasn't the way we were in our family, you know. I just I swallowed it all, but from that point, I realized. That, I, that, that there was no authority you could trust. I, would not, I couldn't trust him, and, and it took a long, long time to get over that. Um, and I realized that, you know, that was, without really, you know, putting it in words to myself, that by extension, all other authority would come under the same um, umbrella of mistrust, that, that there'd be, you know, people who, who go around thinking they're doing good by destroying your work. <laughs> Are not to be trusted, right. you know. And my poor dad. I mean, he, you know, he, he meant well, and we never. If we'd ever been able to talk about it, I'm sure we would have. I would have got over it in no time. But it was the kind of family where you didn't talk about stuff like that. So, just festered. Well, that's thank you. That that kind of leads us to more authority figures, uh, mm. with which you have. You know, some of them have it coming. <laughs> some of them, <laughs> right? I I I I, I was. I became nine or ten, or I kind of became aware uh, right around the beginning of uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected president um, in 1980, I believe. Mm -hmm. And coming from a conservative household myself, Catholic, uh, private Catholic school, all that stuff, um, and watched, we watched TV, and that's all we did. There was maybe two books in our house. Um, we, we watched MTV and we watched the news and all that stuff. And, and coming from my point of view, you got the sense that the Reagan administration, things, the United States in general, um, was a very squeaky clean, very moralistic uh, endeavor, and you couldn't help but to think about that uh, if you were within, you know, your four walls of your house and you had your television on most of the time, and especially if you had parents who were not necessarily free thinkers, love your mom and dad, you know, uh, and in reading your book, I felt like I learned more about the United States in the 80s and the 90s, even in the 2000s since 9-11, uh, than I ever could have in my four years of private Catholic high school. Uh, 
sorry, Mr. Sikowski, but that's just the truth. <laughs> and I can can you touch up upon it a little bit? It, it's a very broad question as far as you know your your take on on what you've done uh, with humanitarian efforts in Central America. I didn't even know what was really going on in Nicaragua until I read your memoir. And um, a lot of people don't nowadays because it's old, it's old, it's ancient history, sort of now for especially the way as you said you know people don't want, don't read. Generally speaking, everybody gets their information from from their phone mostly, so a lot of people don't know uh, even the very the, the pretty recent history of the world, and it's not just the United States. I mean, the, the United States is is um, it's central to the to parts of this book because it's where I'm spending my time, and if you live in Canada, if you grow up in Canada, you grow up. Uh, in the shadow of the United States to a great extent. And when I was young, very young, we were kind of, we saw ourselves as kind of a, a balancing, doing a balancing act between the British heritage and, and the American presence. So, you know, American things were fine. I mean, there was always a little bit of uh, envy mixed with resentment and, uh, and the real, you know, American stuff was fine, but the real good stuff was British. In my household, you know, uh, growing up, subsequent experience has suggested to me that that isn't 100 percent true. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there's good things everywhere you go, and not, and and not so good things. But um, I mean, we love to drive American cars and play American guitars, and watch American movies and all that stuff, and we're, we're totally influenced by that. But uh, at the same time, as a Canadian, there was a distance from that. I mean, you could step back and you go, yeah, but look at what these guys are doing. Look at the, these, look, they tried to plant nuclear missiles on Canadian soil without asking us in the 50s. That didn't go over very big in Canada. And then, you know, it was a big scandal. The government fell because of that. And, and for instance, right, I doubt anybody in the United States even heard about that. But, um, but at the same time, Canada and the U.S. have always been very close partners, uh, defense-wise, and for good reason, obviously. So you know, nothing's black and white. I mean, th this is the thing. But but I grew up with a, as a Canadian, with a, with a distance, a, a kind of arm's length distance from the goings on, and, and certainly no uh, sense of of owing the United States anything, uh, as a in a patriotic sense, right? Uh, my patriot. Patriotic feelings were directed toward things Canadian, so you, you know it gave me a, 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 a kind of objectivity that, that to start with, and then that got added to a lot by the experiences that I had and the contacts with various kinds of people. Because of, during this period that you're talking about, there, I got I wasn't interested in politics to start out at all. I mean, I, I was aware of what was going on in the world, but it always. I'd been taught that art and politics shouldn't mix, that, that, that art would suffer the minute you inject sort of anything political into it, that the, the art goes out the window. And I, I just kind of didn't ever re-examine that until um, the, the, toward the end of the 70s when I started to travel outside of Canada a lot, traveling in Italy, traveling in, in where, where the political situation was quite chaotic. Uh, and you couldn't really ignore it, and it and it made sense somehow to to, to make reference to this stuff in songs. And to, in the early '80s, Latin America, in Central America in particular, um, I was reading about it a lot, and which is why I ended up going. I wanted to. I got curious about what, about Nicaragua in particular because here was a you know this this revolution. That did not seem to conform to my stereotype of a banana republic revolution. Like, what is this? I want to see it up close. And eventually, I got lucky, and, and a, um, Oxfam, a charitable agency, aid agency, approached me about going on their behalf as a witness to the stuff that was going on. And that's what uh, really started to open my eyes about the economic relationship that exists in the world and, and, and the way in which that touches all of our lives. You, you, you know, you, you, uh, you and I are the beneficiaries of a system that exploits people all, all over the world. 
the, the, the price of that exploitation, of, of centuries of that exploitation, and then starting with the European colonial period, uh, is, is now coming back around, and it's ISIS. Uh, it's, that's one manifestation of this. There's, there are others. And I mean, that's not all ISIS is. ISIS, I mean, I mean, it's a despicable, completely unjustifiable, from any perspective that makes sense uh, phenomenon. But, but it is, I think, an, a, a direct result of that, that exploitative system. And, the, and people cheer ISIS, people go join ISIS because they think that it speaks for the exploited and the, and the, and the oppressed. And boy, you know, I mean, we we were all, I, I, we. I don't know if I ever really quite subscribed to this, but I knew lots of people and uh, who couldn't wait for the revolution. You know, it's like ah, it's coming, it's coming. We, we're going to turn it around. We're going to make the world a better place. Well, that's the revolution. How do you like it? You know, uh, personally, I I don't like it at all. And uh, but it but it springs from uh, from a need. It, it, there wouldn't be any support for it if, if that weren't true. Uh, it's not, uh, maybe there would on some sort of satanic spiritual level or something. But, um, but I, don't, I don't think you'd have that kind of stuff going on in the same way. I mean, you'd always have people that are disgruntled, no matter what you've got going on, because it's human nature. But, um, but that, that degree of uh, resistance to the status quo. I mean, it's kind of a global equivalent of Pol Pot in Cambodia, with, where it, it's, they, they want to reduce everything to year zero and start over again. You know, and these jerks are, are doing it. In, you know, in the ostensible name of Islam, but but basically their approach is the same thing: is wipe it all out and start again. Well, you know, I mean, to some extent, uh, our forebears brought it on us. We can't say we really brought it on ourselves, although we don't. Most of us aren't doing enough to address the energy behind that. But um, but we're we're the, the heirs of, of a set of circumstances that's that's producing this stuff. So you know, and it, I mean, far more important, I think, than that is is the, the uh, environmental effect of of the last fifty years. You know right, that. Um, uh, the, the time, actually, basically my lifetime, me and Pico are only kind of peak about the same time, right? And, and it's 1945, uh, after the Second World War, when when the current version of things really started to take shape, and um, the amount of uh, environment, environmental degradation that's taken place since then is astounding, and it's not stopping. It's not even slowing down. So you know. That is a, a far bigger deal than, than uh, you know, kind of ISIS, which I think they're not going to go away soon. But they're, from a sort of historical perspective, they're probably a flash in the pan. But the the, the environmental stuff is not. So you know, we need to get on that. But easy for me to say sitting here, uh, you know, because nobody's asking me to do anything right now other than talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done your share, Bruce. I would like to ask uh, Bruce about uh, your connection with the divine through female humans. That's, you mentioned this in your book, and I, I would like your, your take on that. Yeah, it sounds very mysterious if we just leave it as a question, <laughs> actually. Uh, far more entertaining than the truth, probably. But, it, but um, I've just got a lot of... I've learned a lot about life from... The female partners that I've had, and, and from other women that have been friends also, uh, but um, the I you know got interested in in exploring what I perceived to be a spiritual dimension to life early on in my teens, and uh, totally rejected the idea of of a Christian approach to that, and you know flirted with others. I read some philosophers, and I and I read about Buddhism and I got into the occult a little bit um, but uh, it was Kitty my first wife who really made uh, the, my understanding of Christianity 
uh, go in a direction that I could work with. I mean, uh, you know, we used to read the Bible as a sort of chronicle of horrors, but the Old Testament, especially, is it, where there's some really, you know, nasty bits in there that uh, that were you'd read them and you'd go, oh man, you know, and it was entertainment, but it was also uh, a justification for sneering at the whole concept of uh, of religious faith, but. Uh, so I, I missed it, you know, or never bothered to kind of get into other aspects of what the Bible had to say. So Kitty, by way of adolescent revolution, had had abandoned her free thinking upbringing and become kind of some kind of evangelical for a, a couple of years, and and had learned a lot about that. So we, I heard a lot about that from her, and and then started reading people like C.S. Lewis and others, and okay, this is a viable approach to God and it, it convinced me that that it wasn't something to fool around with exactly that there was I mean you could but more important it was there was a relationship to be had that that should be developed by whatever means you could and I learned a lot about that from from Kitty as a, as a person and, all, and from her background and and others I mean you know other relationships that I've had um, have not been as specifically Christian in orientation, but or, you know, or biblical. But um, I've just learned a lot about what it is to be a human being from the women I've been with, far more than from any other uh, demographic that I can generalize about. I guess you could say. In that coming, you do not have any sisters, am I correct? That's correct. Yeah, I have two brothers and. Um, so you know, so I mean, I don't know what it's like to have sisters, but but uh, I sort of woke up one one day some years ago and realized I was I I had all these different relationships and I I never imagined myself as somebody that would have that in my life when I started out. I got married to Kitty and that was it. I mean, we made a promise in front of God that we were going to be together forever till we drop, and uh, that didn't happen didn't happen, I mean, I can't say I wouldn't have made that move eventually myself, but it was her choice to break it up, and um, so I'm saying to God, well, what's this about, you know, we, we, we went to all the trouble of promising in front of you, and then and now you're letting this happen, and, you know, there wasn't quite a, a concrete word answer to that, but, but the, the answer that did appear through circumstance and, and feeling was, yeah, Yes, I let it happen because this is how you grow, and you you know you guys are done had gone as far as you were going to go together, and you you got to go your own ways anyway. I'm totally done with this, so uh, um, you know that was a it was a pretty earth shaking experience for me, and, and you know then but then years later I'm realizing you know I could be one of these guys that the tabloids write about because I've had all these relationships and stuff, but. I never meant to, to to do that, but it worked out that way, and I I don't regret it, at, um, because I've learned a lot from all of them, and um, and hopefully you know they got something out of me too. Excellent. And in, in mentioning the thing in your book, we don't we don't change; we just keep adding on and then modify. Uh, yeah, the modifications I mean, as humans. I, yeah, I feel like that. I, I mean, I I can't swear that we don't. That we're not capable of cha real change. I think people who've, uh, you know, gone to AA or NA or whatever may feel quite differently about that. They may feel like their life did totally change. People who've undergone near-death experiences maybe would say the same thing. I don't know, but for me, it it just felt like uh, I'm still the person I started out to be. I've learned a lot more about who that is, and in the process, added things that. That the events of life have, have added to that picture and taken away from it. Um, you know, you get calluses, you also get wounds that don't heal, and and uh, all of that teaches you something and, and and shapes you. So you know, the people that are close to me now, my current wife and and uh, little daughter, uh, are are both the beneficiaries and the victims of all that life and learning. <laughs> And that leads us to, our, to kind of our, our, our almost final question here of um, you've, you've brought up a daughter in the 70s, 
right? Uh, Jenny, yeah. uh, uh, quite a significant time ago, and now you have a four-year-old daughter, Iona. Yeah. And what, what, how is it different now than it was then, in, in your experience of, of raising a little girl in this world? Um, I, Jenny was about the age Iona is now when her mom and I split up. So there was a lot of bringing up Jenny that I didn't get to do, which I will, if I live long enough, get to do with Iona. I'll get, I'll, I still have to find out about that. But um, so far, the two big differences are, are uh, me, because, one is me because I'm just, uh, there's lots I get stressed about still, but, I don't, but it's not the same stuff I got stressed about when, when Jenny was little. I, I worried about my, I didn't think of it as a career, but that's what I worried about. I worried about being able to get in front of people and do what I do. So I, I was not totally present for her because a, a lot of my focus was on myself and, and my own stuff that I felt like I had to do. Um, for one thing, that's changed. I still have that interest in getting on performing well and not screwing up, but, uh, but I'm a lot more available for this daughter. Uh, the other thing that's that's really changed is the world. I mean, you know, Iona's got a, a, basically the kid equivalent of an iPad. You know, she's four years old, and she knows how to run it. And and she every day, every other day, she's come up with some new things she can do with it on her own. You know, and I mean that just wasn't part of life forty years ago. Right. Does she troubleshoot for you <clears throat> on your own uh, problems with the internet? Or Not or yet. She she can create trouble for me by messing <laughs> with my iPad. <laughs> but uh, but but she's she's. I mean, it was interesting, actually, a little bit shocking, and and not not totally a surprise. The first time she ever saw TV, she was completely captivated by it, and uh, and I you know. I mean, I can't be in a room with a TV going and not be captivated by it too. I, you know, no matter what's on, like the, you know, Japanese rock videos or a football game, which I'm not interested in, it will have the same effect. It'll just be like oh, they're talking to you, and I'm looking over here to sort of see what's going on on the screen. And it, there's something. At one point, a few years ago, it occurred to me that TV touches us, it touches our brains at, at kind of the same level as dreams happen. Somewhere in there, there's there's a relationship, and I, I don't know if it, there's anything to really back that up. But it was a, uh, I just had that sense that that the imagery of TV hits it hits our being in the same way that the dream imagery does. It kind of replaces it with some ersatz thing, and and there's something uh, something about that. I don't think I mean, we're not just predators watching the movement on TV in case there's prey, you know, I mean, which would be another explanation for why it's so fascinating, perhaps, but I, I don't think it's that. I, I, you know, cats looking out a window at birds, yeah, that, they do that, but, but uh, um, there's something sinister about screens, and I haven't really figured out what that is, and I'm not going to do anything about it anyway. I watch TV all the time when I'm alone in a hotel room. It's what I like to do, <laughs> but at home I don't because I don't have time, and I, the things I like to watch are not things I want I own watching. So, you know, anything with serial killers and stuff, you know. So. Right, or just the commercials in general. Well, the commercials, yeah. There are, <laughs> she watch kids to, watches kids TV every now and then, and, and the commercials are atrocious. They're, uh, to see. To, to see the effect of them on a, on a, a virgin mind like that, you know, it's, it's disturbing. Yes. It, it's, it's gotten much more seductive nowadays. Yeah, no, they're good at that stuff. Do you wish, for, for Iona, you know, her father is a successful musician, has always been uh, since, you, since you started, you, you've, you've elevated your career and you've done it. You've, you've, you've made a life in music as well as made a difference in the world, in third world countries, humanitarian awards, this and that. You've gotten involved. You've been around the world. Would you will that upon your daughter? Uh, at, you know, from your point of view. Well, what I hope for for her is that she finds something to be absorbed in, that that's meaningful in her life, and that she's able to pursue that w without too many impediments. And uh, you know, that can translate into almost anything. But uh, I can't predict what her life. You know what choices she's going to make in her life. Uh, she's very musical now and very interested in music, 
and she comes to a lot of shows. She's she's been on tour with me a lot, and so she's kind of got this sense of what it is to get up on stage and have a microphone in front of you and all that. And she likes it, uh, but uh, what she'll do with it as, a, as, a, as she grows, who knows? But I, I, I think the she's growing up in a world that's really different from the one I grew up in, and she's going to have to make something out of that 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 I didn't have to do. So that I just I'm kind of rooting for her for to have the, the energy and the, the the wherewithal to the intellectual wherewithal to kind of deal with that. Good luck. I have yeah. to do it myself, Bruce. So yeah, good luck to you too. <laughs> right. I'm just not sure if I'm supposed to use a chainsaw or you know whatever it is. But anyway, that's that's all that's a whole other story. And that's a different channel probably. It depends on who's in front of the chainsaw. Right, exactly. So I would I would like to thank thank you Bruce for for coming to KRCB and and, and enjoying some time with us today. Uh, oh, thank you. And and once again, if you get your hands on this book, please go and buy it. And and it is a wonderful wonderful exploration of of a man from in chronological order uh, from from the get go of of being a, a youth in Canada, right? And um, mm -hmm. and making his life as a musician back in the '60s and and making it till today. And 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 all the stuff that happened with Reagan and all that you know is is eye-opening to me, given that I thought the guy was squeaky clean like Bob's big boy. Uh, not true. Uh, and so that, now I, I can just get off my own tangent, but go get this book. It's, it's amazing. You, you will not want to stop reading it. I think I read like 100 pages one night and, and literally started having dreams about Guantanamo and, and, and Nicaragua and, and various things. So, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, memoirs, I'm sorry, a memoir, uh, Rumors of Glory, which is also a title of one of your songs. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it just seemed like a fitting title for the book. You know, there's, for all of the, 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 you know, you cited a whole bunch of, of accolades and whatever that we first started a conversation, and I, for all of that, um, you know, I've, I've never really had a big international hit or anything. I mean, and you could ask my manager who we talked about earlier, Bernie, about that too. Maybe Bernie, that means a lot more to Bernie than it does to me, but. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like as, as this, this, the publishers approached me with an invitation to do this book, and what they said was, we'd like you to write a spiritual memoir. Well, I said, oh, that sounds interesting, but what's a spiritual memoir? Well, we don't know, but that's what we want you to do. <laughs> so You're this, is, this is the result, and, and so Rumors of Glory kind of has a double meaning, both in terms of, in, you know, the pragmatic global, ter or worldly terms, and, and in terms of my sense of of that spiritual reality, I guess. But anyway, there it is. Great. Well, and and of course, if you get the chance, listen to Bruce Coburn. All his, his great albums, they don't get old. They're timeless. You know, uh, with the message and all that good stuff. <laughs> Bernie, I'm coming after you. I'm going to be the new manager of Bruce Coburn. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, once again, thank you very much for for joining us. It's been thank quite you. the honor. I really yeah, appreciate being next to you and, and talking about music in the world and.